Well, good afternoon. It's nice to see so many people here. As Richard said, my name is Jennifer Brower. I'm a dispensing optician and low vision practitioner working in Rickmansworth in Hertfordshire. And I'm going to talk to you today about how macular problems affect your eyes, what is involved in a low vision assessment, and really what can be done to help. Low vision is the term used when someone's sight is below normal, even with spectacles or contact lenses, and they have difficulty with everyday visual tasks, such as reading, writing, or watching TV. At the start of a low vision assessment, the practitioner will check your sight and determine how well you can see with and without your spectacles. Before I talk about the assessment in more detail, it may be useful to explain what a dispensing optician is, because often people don't know. Well, a dispensing optician is a highly trained optical professional who dispenses or supplies spectacles to an optical prescription issued by an optometrist. It's a little like the relationship that the pharmacist has with a doctor. There are many different professionals working in the field of low vision, including dispensing opticians, optometrists, ophthalmic nurses, rehab officers, and also social workers. However, the supply of spectacles, spectacle-mounted low vision aids, and certain other types of complex aids to blind or partially sighted people is restricted by law to opticians registered with the General Optical Council. That's a little bit like the General Medical Council is for doctors. Uh, my association, the Association of British Dispensing Opticians, there's just over 5,500 registered dispensing optician members who may provide spectacles, contact lenses, or low vision aids. Now, of course, there are many different eye problems which cause low vision, but macular disease is one of the most common, particularly in older people. One question I'm often asked is, what exactly is the macula and how does it affect my sight? Well, the macula is a tiny area at the back of the eye in the very centre of the inner lining of the eye called the retina. The macula is only about five millimetres across, that's less than a quarter of an inch, but it's responsible for colour vision and fine detail, such as seeing people's faces, reading, and writing. And of course, damage to the macula will affect how you see when you look straight ahead, either in the long distance or close up, and it results in distorted or, or missing bits of vision and may affect how you see colours. This damaged part of the macula is often called a scotoma or blind spot. The most common cause of macular damage in older people is macular degeneration, but other causes include macular hole, diabetes, and high myopia. Now, although macular problems are noticeable in your vision and can cause difficulty with everyday tasks, such as reading the newspaper, using the cooker, or taking medicines, they don't cause complete blindness, and the side vision remains unaffected so that you don't normally have problems getting around. Another very frequent question I'm asked by my patients regularly is, why can't I just have stronger glasses? Spectacles are designed to focus light on the retina at the back of the eye to produce a sharp image. And perhaps if you think of the eye as a camera and the retina as the film, however good the camera is, or however powerful the glass is, if the film, the retina, is damaged, you'll never get a perfect picture. And increasing the power of the lenses will simply produce a blurred image in the eye. Spectacles can help, though, in a different way, and I, I will speak about that a little bit later. If you are someone with low vision, you may be registered partially sighted or blind, also known nowadays as sight impaired or severely sight impaired. And there are many benefits associated with registration, both financial and practical, including travel concessions, some VAT exemption, and also free NHS sight tests. Of course, registration is optional, but it is worth thinking about if you've been advised that your sight has reached this level and cannot be improved by medication or surgery. When you are registered, your consultant will often refer you for low vision assessment to a clinic within the hospital or a specialist low vision practitioner working in optical practice. 
If you decide not to take up the option of registration, or if your vision hasn't progressed that far, you're still entitled to receive low vision assessment and low vision aids, which are provided by the health service on a free permanent loan basis. Also available, of course, will be many of the services offered by organisations like the Macular Disease Society and the RNIB. During your low vision assessment, as I said before, your practitioner will assess your, assess your vision with and without your glasses to establish how well you can see and also make a note of your prescription. We'll ask you about your ocular and general health and any family history of eye problems or other conditions which could affect your eyes. And of course, we also need to establish which type of eye condition you have. The next question will be about the problems you're having with your sight, your occupation and hobbies, and how they are all affected. It is really important that you tell us this information, and equally, we want to know about your own expectations and wishes. Sometimes patients say they don't read much, but is that because they're not interested in reading or because it's just too difficult to see the print? People don't always volunteer information about their hobbies, hobbies that they may have given up, maybe because they think there's no chance of getting them back. Whatever the reasons, we try to ask the right questions to get the full picture so that we can advise the most effective solutions. It might, of course, also be worth considering some new hobbies where vision isn't really that important, but we do try to do everything possible to help you continue with your favourites. So, once we have this information, we'll then discuss with you how to deal with all sorts of everyday situations, whether it's reading letters, maps or books, going to the theatre, writing a shopping list, playing the piano, playing cards, even getting the right bus, looking at photographs, cooking, or managing the different sort of visual problems which may arise at work or at college. The good news is, and I'm sure most of you are aware of this, that people with macular problems usually respond well to magnifying aids because by making things larger, they become easier to see. Now, this sounds very simple, and in some respects it is. However, the skill is in determining the amount of magnification needed, the type of magnifying aid that we're going to recommend for you, and not least, the way it's used. Now, the reason that magnification works is that the size of the damaged macular area remains constant, whatever you're looking at. If you imagine, say, putting a five pence coin on the page of a book, of course, you won't be able to read the, the letters or the word underneath this coin. If you then take the book away and you enlarge the print size sufficiently, then put the 5p coin back in the same position, it will cover much less of the word and you'll probably be able to read it all. The amount of magnification will vary depending on how much your vision has been affected and prescribing the right amount and the best types of magnifier for you will be determined by the practitioner. But of course, taking into account everything that's been said and discussed during the assessment. Your practitioner will normally assess the magnifica magnification required for both far distance and for reading vision and sometimes distances in between, depending upon your occupation and your hobbies. So if you use a computer, for example, you're going to use a sort of an intermediate distance. It's not as close as normal reading, but it's not as far as the television. Trying out various types of magnifiers will then help you both choose the right ones for you. And although it can sometimes take a bit of getting used to, it's really worth persevering until you're happy. Now, I'm sure that many of you already use lots of different aids, which may include large print books and newspapers, handheld magnifiers, magnifiers with lights in, ones that rest on the page, some which clip onto glasses, or even monocular telescopes or binoculars. But all these aids follow the same principle. If you make things bigger, they'll be easier to see. I mentioned wearing glasses earlier, and the fact that people with low vision sometimes wonder why they're still advised to wear their glasses as they don't seem to help very much. Now, I said that lenses focus a sharp image onto the retina at the back of the eye, even if you can't see it sharply, 
And it's this which gives the best foundation for magnification because you're magnifying a good, clear, sharp image rather than an out-of-focus, fuzzy one. Your practitioner may also advise you to wear your long-distance glasses with certain types of magnifiers and your reading glasses with others. One problem which comes up all the time is if you wear bifocal or verifocal lenses. Because the macular scotoma, or the blind spot, is in the very center of your vision, when you look straight ahead through the small reading area of a bifocal or verifocal lens, the scotoma may simply just block it out and it's virtually useless. It's often better to have a separate pair of spectacles just for close reading so that you have the whole lens at your disposal. And that can make quite a difference to the amount of magnification you need. Because the smaller the amount, the better, because larger images take longer to read. The type of magnifier recommended will, of course, depend on what you need to see, the amount of magnification required, and how easy it is to use. There are many other considerations to take into account, such as how far you have to hold the magnifier away from what you're looking at. Again, what we said, whether you need to use long-distance glasses or reading specs, and how light is going to affect the amount of magnification that you need. If you maybe have a hand tremor or some arthritis in your fingers, it may be quite difficult for you to hold a magnifier. And there are plenty of hands-free options, such as a magnifier and a cord, which you can wear around your neck, or a flip-up lens clipped onto your spectacles. And these will be much more comfortable to use. To expand further on the range of low vision aids, handheld magnifiers are the commonest and may be round or rectangular and vary in size, although rectangular magnifiers are quite good because they do tend to give a wider reading area. The general rule is the smaller the magnifier, the more powerful, the higher the magnification. And the higher the magnification, the closer you have to hold the page or the print to your eyes. Both circular and rectangular types are available as simple magnifiers of low power, which make things, say, two or three times larger, sometimes including a light, right up to very complex magnifiers, which need very precise focusing and magnify up to 30 times. If you only need low levels of magnification, just need a little bit of help, you may like a flat field magnifier, also known as a bright field magnifier or bright mag, because it gathers in a large amount of light. It's a small, clear, dome-shaped block, simply rests on the page and doubles the size of the print. One of the advantages of these bright mags is they're very easy to slip into your pocket or handbag, and they're very discreet in use. We do try to advise things that don't draw attention to the problem, Stand magnifiers are round or rectangular, and as their name suggests, they also rest on the page, but this time in a little frame, and that holds the lenses a few inches above the page. They're designed so that you can get a pen underneath the lens, so they're useful for both reading and writing. Very good for crosswords and puzzles, because of course they magnify both the questions and the answers. And stand magnifiers are very useful for things like knitting patterns or recipes, because again, they're hands-free. Just move them across the page as you want to read more of the recipe. Now, there are very special reading glasses available called spectacle magnifiers, which have very powerful lenses, and they can be helpful for people who don't normally wear glasses for long distance. They're another hands-free option, but again, because of the power, the print has to be held quite close to the eye for the right focus. They're sometimes made with shallow or half-eye lenses so that you can look over the top for TV and other long-distance tasks. And, of course, many patients do prefer just to wear a pair of spectacles rather than use a magnifier. And your practitioner will be able to advise on whether they're right for you. Shopping is another problem, and for this task, pocket magnifiers are very useful. They can be quite small, sometimes have a light inside, and they're very easy to carry around and simple to use. There are some new sort of whiz-bang modern versions, which are electronic. They're a little bit larger, but with this type, you can vary the magnification and the color. So you can have black and white, 
white on black, yellow and blue, and full colour. They also have an image capture facility, very handy if you're not close enough to the price to actually see it. You just can't get close enough, like at the back of a fridge or on a high shelf. You simply point the unit at what you want to see, press a button on the top, and it's a little bit like taking a photograph. It captures that image. You can then increase the size of it as suits you just by a flick of a switch. Now, one of the commonest concerns for people with macular problems is seeing the TV. Given that the larger the TV picture is, the easier it is to see, modern large screen televisions have been a boon. But lots of people do have the more traditional types. And if you have a smaller TV screen, you can double the size of the picture simply by sitting half the distance away. So, for example, if you're finding it's a bit hard to see the subtitles on a film and you sit, say, 10 feet away from the television, if you sit at only 5 feet, you're going to immediately double the size of the picture. It may be, though, if you sit very close to the television, it may be that your practitioner will have to adjust the power of your spectacles because you're going to be sitting at a closer distance. There are also special adjustable TV specs, which you can wear to also double the image size. So if you were to wear them and also sit at half the distance, you will effectively see a TV picture four times the size. And I have to say, the importance of working distances, how far you are away from something, and how near or far the magnifier has to be placed, are extremely important. Other aids for long-distance use include monocular telescopes. I'm sure some of you have those, which are really like a half pair of binoculars. And they're very handy for bus numbers and street signs. And there are some that you can clip onto your glasses for the theatre, cinema, or even watching sport. There's a whole new range of modern electronic aids, um, including CCTVs or video, uh, sorry, video magnifiers, as they call them now. These can either be freestanding or you can link them into your own TV set so that your own TV screen becomes a monitor. And magnification up to 50 times the size is possible. And you can use them for almost anything. Books, newspapers, photographs, recipes, even instructions on uh, packets and tins, particularly useful if you've got a, a circular surface. If you use a computer, and I know a lot of you do, the font size can be enlarged. And you can also get large print keyboard covers, which are quite useful. And, of course, some of you may have large number telephones and now mobile phones with the large print keys. It doesn't always have to be about magnification, though, to help you. A low vision aid really can be defined as anything which helps someone with low vision. And it includes, as we said before, large print books, newspapers and playing cards, tinted lenses, needle threaders coin holders, and talking watches and alarm clocks. There's also a range of talking books, um, and I'm sure you're familiar with those, and also there's a network of talking newspapers in the UK, which provides audio versions of national newspapers. One of the most important low vision aids, though, is light. The average 60-year-old person with normal sight needs around about three times the light of the average 20-year-old And, of course, for older people, particularly with macular problems, good light is a must. One very important point is the closer the light is positioned to what you're looking at, the better you will see. And a small lamp, even with a lowish power uh, bulb in it, will give you far more help than a very strong bulb way up in the ceiling. So proximity to what you're looking at is everything. Another very useful non-optical aid is tinted lenses. Patients with macular problems are often more sensitive to glare, and this is certainly common in patients who also have cataract or some other eye conditions. The colour and the depth, the darkness of the tint, is absolutely crucial because different colours have different effects on vision, and depending how dark the tint is, it can affect how well you see. So advice from your low vision practitioner is very useful here, as well, of course, as trying out different colours. If it's practical, I usually take my patients outside to try different tints, because, of course, daylight has a totally different effect uh, on colour than uh, indoor light. 
I do find, though, in many situations, an amber or orange tint can be a great help because it enhances contrast and it sharpens the image. And if you have cataract as well as macular degeneration, this sort of tint can be very restful. I did say before that with macular problems, side vision or peripheral vision is unaffected. Apart from helping you get around, side vision can be very useful when you're watching TV or reading. And I'm sure some of you have found this out for yourselves. Instead of looking straight at the television, if you look slightly to the side, you may be able to see a little better because you're actually using an undamaged part of the macula. Now, this technique is called eccentric viewing, and it takes quite a bit of practice, but it can be very helpful. And you can also adapt it for close reading. Another technique to help with reading is called steady eye strategy. And in this case, the eye remains still and the page is slowly moved across the line of vision. That takes a bit of more getting used to, but I do have patients who use it very successfully. At the end of the assessment, you will often be able to take your aids away with you unless something special has to be ordered and you normally collect it a week or so later. You normally be given a date for a second visit so that the practitioner can assess how you're getting on with the aids, whether any changes are needed, and discuss any concerns you may have. After that, aftercare generally continues on a six to 12 month basis so that we can monitor your progress with your low vision aids and also keep a watch on your site. But of course, we're always very happy to see you in between if you have any problems or if you need any replacement magnifiers. Also very important, we recommend that you have your eyes examined regularly by the optometrist, usually once a year, to keep a check on the progress of your eye condition and any changes to your spectacle prescription. I hope this talk has been of some use for you.